Hey everyone, this is Joshua Sturgill. Uh, in this video, we're going to be discussing spectroscopy and we're going to be working through uh, an example problem uh, and discussing a compound uh, and the specific properties of that compound. Um, so, below, down here, um, I've provided the HNMR, the CNMR, and the IR for a particular compound, um, and the molecular formula for this compound is six carbons, 12 hydrogens, and two oxygens. Um, so I would encourage you to pause the video at this point and uh, go ahead and see if you can um, work through the data as well as using the molecular formula uh, and come up with a reasonable structure um, for this compound. All right, so hopefully you had a chance to uh, work through that. I'm going to go ahead and drag over uh, this information right here. Whoops. All right, so the name of this compound is butyl acetate, and there is the structure um, of butyl acetate that I provided. Um, so let's go ahead and start with the HNMR. Um, as far as the hydrogens on this compound, are concerned. Um, we have two right there that I'm going to label as H1. We have three over here. I'm going to label those hydrogens um, because they're equivalent uh, as H2. These two here is H3, H4, and H5. Okay, so those five um, sets of hydrogens correlate to the five peaks that we see over here on the HNMR. Um, the most downfield hydrogens in this, uh, in this compound that are showing up on the HNMR uh, happen to be H1, uh, what we labeled as H1, showing up here at about 3.9. Um, those hydrogens are coming directly off of a carbon, uh, which is directly attached to the oxygen of an ester group, um, and therefore it has um, a shift value there uh, around 4. Um, so again, H1 is our most deshielded hydrogens of butyl acetate. H2 uh, will come next. This next peak that we see here over at about 1.9. Um, you know, these hydrogens aren't, aren't as deshielded as the hydrogens that we labeled H1 because they're not coming directly off of an oxygen within the ester group. They're coming um, off of a carbon that's attached to a carbon within the ester group. Um, and so these hydrogens are just normal uh, methyl group hydrogens, although they are showing up more downfield uh, than we would see with a, uh, with a normal uh, methyl group. They're closer to a shift value of, of 2. Um, these next two peaks that we see here at uh, about 1.5-ish and about 1.3, um, those are the, the hydrogens that we label we have labeled as H3 and H4. Um, and this final peak, uh, peak cluster over here, corresponds to the hydrogens of H5, showing up at about 1.8. Uh, and the reason behind those three peaks is, is generally simple. Um, as we move further away from the ester group, the uh, electron withdrawing powers of, of, of oxygen uh, within the ester group and uh, the resonance that's also um, present within an ester group. As we move further away from that, um, our hydrogens will be uh, more shielded um, and have more electron density. So we see that pattern moving that way down the carbon chain of, of, our, of our compound. Another thing that helps with um, an HNMR is um, uh, the integration curves that we see um, in the faint red color behind our peaks. Um, integration curves, uh, based on their height, they tell us the, um, the amount of hydrogens, uh, of equivalent hydrogens that correspond to that peak. So the, the hydrogens that we have labeled H2 and H5 on butyl acetate, I'll go ahead and circle those uh, in red real quick just so we know where we're at. Those hydrogens labeled H2 and H5, there are three hydrogens corresponding, um, there are three hydro equivalent hydrogens there. And if we look at where those peaks are on the HNMR, I'll point to them in red. The integration curve um, is taller for those two, for those two peaks. And then I'll go ahead and circle in green um, our H3, H1, and H4 hydrogens 
corresponding to this peak, this peak, and this peak. Uh, and, and we can see that those integration curves um, happen to be shorter than the integration curves for the H2 and the H5 hydrogens. And so that's what integration curves provide for us. Uh, they, pro they just provide additional data um, as far as the amount of hydrogens corresponding to, to particular peaks. Um, down here on the CNMR, um, things are going to look uh, somewhat similar to the HNMR. I'm just going to go ahead and label uh, our carbons as one. Now let's do this. Let's go one, um, two, three, four, five, six. Those six, those six carbons. Um, carbon number one will be the most downfield um, carbon of our compound. Um, it is within an ester group, and um, carbons that are within an ester group typically show up between about a shift value of 160 to 185, somewhere within there. Um, and that's where this peak uh, is showing up. Um, the next uh, most deshielded carbon will be our carbon number two. Um, similar to the reasons why the hydrogens back up, the, up there on the HNMR, uh, the reasons why those were so far downfield relative to the other peaks um, happens to be the same reasons for this carbon that we have labeled carbon number two. Uh, it's directly attached to an oxygen within an ester group. Um, oxygens are, are typically electron withdrawing, um, and this ester group also has some resonance, uh, resonance power that uh, is causing more electron density to be taken away from uh, the carbon that we have labeled carbon number two. Um, from there, uh, carbon number three is going to be the next uh, most deshielded carbon. Um, this carbon isn't directly attached to an oxygen. It's not within the uh, the ester group directly, but it, it is attached to carbon number one. Uh, carbon number one has little electron density, um, and and that that makes carbon number three also electron poor uh, because there isn't a lot of electron density uh, making its way over there to carbon number three. Uh, from there, uh, it's, it's going to be similar to, to what we talked about with the uh, the HNMR spectrum above. Uh, we have carbon number four, carbon number five, and carbon number six just down the carbon chain there. Uh, the further away we move from the ester group and from the electron withdrawing uh, capacity of the oxygens, the more electron density um, these carbons will have and the more uh, upfield that they will show show up at on the CNMR. Um, so with HNMR and CNMR it's all about being able to identify electron density it's all being, it's about being able to identify specific functional groups uh, and, and being able to, to memorize the uh, shift values that, um, that correspond to, uh, to, to particular functional groups. Uh, as far as carbon number two, three, four, five, and six, um, those are all just normal, um, you know, methyl and methylene uh, carbons, and those typically will show up uh, between zero and fifty, a shift value of zero and fifty, um, and and carbon number two is a little bit past fifty uh, because it is so close uh, to to that ester group, um, like we discussed. All right, going down to the IR. Um, as far as the IR goes, the, the biggest giveaways for this, uh, for the data here, would have to be um, our uh, sp3 carbon hydrogen uh, bond peak showing up there around 3000. Um, another uh, big giveaway would be um, our carbon double bonded to an oxygen that uh, will show up between 1600. Um, in, in 1800, um, and another uh, peak that that we could identify, um, I'll, I'll go ahead and identify it, a carbon single bonded to an oxygen, uh, and, and specifically an sp3 carbon single bonded to an oxygen. Um, that that the shift the values for for uh, for that particular um, bond between the carbon and the oxygen. Uh, will we'll show between about a thousand and uh, and twelve thousand, and so this peak might actually not um, be um, showing up from from that bond between the carbon and the oxygen just because it's not necessarily within the one thousand uh, to twelve hundred range. 
Um, a good thing to understand with IR is, is usually things below 1500 or even below 2000 uh, tend to be relatively weak evidence. Uh, things tend to get messy, a little hard to identify, and so we might not, it might be better to not even identify that sp3 uh, carbon single bonded to an oxygen. Um, but I'll go ahead and just uh, identify the bonds that we are seeing here. Um, this sp3 carbon bonded to a hydrogen, um, you know, that's, that's all over the place. We have carbons bonded to hydrogens um, uh, throughout this, this compound. And um, the carbon double bond to an oxygen is pretty obvious as well. Uh, right there within the ester group and then we also have a carbon single bond to an oxygen um, which you know is there and here's an sp2 carbon single bond to an oxygen um, so anyway hopefully with working through the hnmr the cnmr and the ir uh, and and being able to identify um, some specific properties of our compound butyl acetate um, we're able to learn a little bit more about um, where things show up as far as data goes uh, and be able to understand how HNMR, CNMR, and IR work a little bit better.